Now, let me say this at the very start. AEW Full Gear was a significantly better show to me than All Out was. Pretty sure I'm not the only one that thinks that. I wouldn't go so far as to say this is the best AEW show that I've seen, but sure as hell better than the last one. And you know what? I'll take it. Seems like they learned some things from the last outing, which felt like it was almost universally considered a disaster. Now, there are certainly things on the show that I didn't like and things that I will gripe about in this review, but I wanted to make clear from Jump Street before I get the clowns that will use their flaming keyboard fingers of fire in the comment section to flame on me for everything that I said. Uh, let me emphasize again. I did largely enjoy enough elements of the show to think it was a good show, a worthwhile show. Is it really worth spending 50 bucks on for myself? I don't know about all that. Like, I would like to see a little bit better show for my taste, if you're going to charge me that much every three or four months. That said, it, it, it is what it is, um, but much, much better than all of them. So I had a much better taste in my mouth late Saturday night, early Sunday morning after watching this show. That said, note the key thing that I said there, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. Um, you know, if you're going to do these pay-per-views once every few months, I can even understand if you want to make them go three and a half, four hours because you're charging so much for the pay-per-view that you want people to feel like they got a lot of show, they got their money's worth. I fundamentally don't have a problem with that. Uh, but, 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 if you're going to do that, then start these shows at seven. I don't think that's asking too much. And some of us got lives, we got other things to do, and we just don't want to stay up that late. And here comes the British crowd talking about, well, try 4 a.m. night. You guys can sit there and pop on YouTube and watch Sebastian Coe and Steve Ovette highlights all day while you're jamming out to Queen or Oasis. Shut up. You're British. You're used to it by now. You know, you've adjusted your whole lives for this. For that, I respect you. But come on, man. You can fill the time by watching highlights of the Moscow Olympics in 1980 and watch as Co wins the 1500 when that wasn't supposed to be his specialty event, that was the 800, or Steve Ovette wins the 800 when it was supposed to be the 1500. The bottom line is, you got things to do when you're British, but America, it's been a long week. I didn't need four hours of wrestling here, if, especially this late. Could have been a little earlier is all I'm saying. I was surprised it kicked off the show with Kenny Omega versus Hangman Page for the number one contenders match. Um, maybe I thought they were going to do Darby Allen and Cody here, but it certainly worked out. Don Callis on commentary, I certainly thought, added something to this. You could also see where these guys have pretty good in-ring chemistry. Like, this was a really, really good opener. Finish didn't work so great to me, but I see that a lot in wrestling now, and I certainly see that a lot in the AEWs and the New Japans of the world. You do all this stuff during the match, and then the finish kind of falls flat when everything should be building to the finish. Um, but I'm glad this match didn't go any longer, or it would have lost me. Not every match needs to go 40, 45 minutes. It's had the right amount of time. These guys could get their crap in, try to tell some type of story, have some type of clear, somewhat decisive winner, and you move on. But you've left enough there to indicate that the story's not done between these two, potentially over the next couple of months, and that's cool. I don't think this is a super heated type of match. It didn't quite... Get, come across to me like that, but it worked. Felt bad for John Silver and Orange Cassidy coming up next because it really felt like a spot of death. It was going to be really, really tough to follow Omega and Page, and it certainly was. And these guys did the best they could. Ripping out the pocket spot was was pretty good, but other than that, it was you know just a filler match, which you have to have some of those sometimes to kind of space out and pace out your pay per view. Orange Cassidy wins like this worked. It was okay for what it had to do. It wasn't supposed to be really good. These guys did the best they could considering the circumstance situation and, and the time that they were given. Um, the TNT title match, though, followed that. And you had Darby Allen taking on Cody. And, and you know, for me personally, you're going to hear me rag on Cody a little bit more than you have probably over the past year plus because this whole Nightmare Collective thing seems like unnecessary overkill, especially as you're trying to present this as somebody that we're supposed to care about or somebody we're supposed to get behind. You know, my own history of Cody aside, like, that just doesn't work. Like, it feels like an ego play. Like, it does not come across well. And now, all of a sudden, it's supposed to be a big deal that Cody can use the Rhodes name. You know, I don't know if Cody's truly a top-tier talent. 
in the business, but he has certainly established that he is a top-tier liar when it comes to professional wrestling. Remember when he said he could use the Rhodes name at any point in time and all this, and he tried to blast people that sat there and insinuated that that wasn't true because it wasn't true, and now he's finally got the use back? Like, congratulations. Moving on. That said, Darby Allen, Cody, have really good in-ring chemistry. They've worked together a few times. They better. And they certainly, certainly do. I think they play really well off of each other. Like, from a pure storytelling aspect, I thought this match, personally, my opinion, was better than Omega versus Page. In my opinion. Um, but that's what I thought. I like the match finish here being less high impact. Makes it stand out a little bit amongst the crowd where you know you're going to see other high impact stuff. Like, I like the way this finish played out. It was close because these two really know each other, are familiar with each other, and either way somebody wins, that it's going to make them feel kind of lucky. Like, totally get that. Um, I'm not sure what to make with the Hogan-style put-over job by Cody. It's Darby Allen that wins, but it's Cody that's on his feet first, and then he's the one waiting for the new champion to get up. Like, that's the type of stuff right there. If you want to compare him to Sippy Slap Nuts or the Man of Three H's, like, that's the stuff. While I usually actually protect Cody against those allegations, they're totally untrue by comparison. Just no factual basis. Not the best night to make that argument last night, because that was some Hogan brother type of stuff. That was some Hunter type of stuff. You beat me, but I'm going to get up first, I'm going to get the belt, and I have to hand it over to you, so that way, even though I'm in theory putting you over, I'm really putting myself over and putting the focus on myself. Like, that's what a star does. Uh, the Team Taz attack was a different spin on it, and I liked it. It wasn't just the fact you might say, well, why didn't you let Darby Allen have a shine here? I kind of like the fact that you're diving right into the next thing. Makes you wonder what the hell you're doing with Cody. But again, here, here comes Cody. He just has to be the one to try and come to the rescue uh, for Darby Allen. Like, it's these types of small, subtle things that makes these guys, you know, where you look at them and you say, okay, this is where they're getting caught up a little too much in their own BS. Like, this is a little reminiscent of Dad. But, but Dad was an infinitely better talent, a way more charismatic performer, and, you know, an actual real megastar, all of that. But I think the biggest kick I got out of this was immediately after Cody and Darby Allen got wiped out. Dustin ain't got no time for that crap. He ain't trying to save his brother. He's backstage doing an interview. He's trying to hype up that bunkhouse match. <laughs> This is my favorite entire segment of the show. I, I can't lie. Like, all of these things that I'm talking about just compile to be like, man, that was magnificent. Uh, what wasn't magnificent, though, was that women's championship match. Nyla Rose and Hikaru Shida. This was bad. Like, this was really sloppy, clumsy. You know, I, I, I don't know. Like, if you're going to do a terrible job, by and large, with your women's division, then when you have your women's division featured on a pay-per-view and you give them the time that you gave them, you better give us something better than this. Like this was Divas Division level terrible. It was brutal. It was bad. Personally, wasn't a fan of the whole Nyla's working Sheeta's knee. And I know you're going to say, well, that takes away one of Sheeta's biggest weapons and that's a cerebral thing. I'm not looking at Nyla to be cerebral. She's supposed to be a monster, a giant in that division. Have her work like a freaking monster or a giant. Have she to be the one that's trying to weaken Nyla Rose's knees, not the other way around. Like, just stupid to me and counterproductive. The only cool thing that I enjoyed about this match, honestly, was the each of them had an opportunity where they had the other person where it looked like they could be pinned, and they pulled them up. Like that, I'm like, okay, they want to dish out more punishment. That, to me, was easily the best part of the match. You know, after the match... With, after Sheeta wins, Vicky's mad at Nyla. Like, that was just awkward. Like, this was just really bad and the perfect embodiment of the women's division of AEW right now, in my opinion. And then we get to the next match, which is the AEW Tag Team Championship. And this, to me, is the embodiment of some of the ills of this company and their mindset and their approach to wrestling. Um, the Young Bucks versus FTR. Like, this is supposed to be a dream match, and this is going to be a big deal. And admittedly, I was looking forward to this, even though I had a creeping suspicion in the back of my mind. Like, you threw out there that unneeded, ridiculous stipulation of the Bucks don't win, they never get to challenge for the title again, titles again. Like, that was stupid and unnecessary. It made you think that the Bucks were going to win. Like, why tip your hand if you don't need to? Why throw off stipulations when you don't need to? 
Like you're supposed to pipe this up as a dream match. Just let it stand on its own merits. Just let it be its own match. Like this is a match that your fans that are buying this pay-per-view can really look forward to without any of the other unnecessary crap. Like even not having Tully out there. Like that worked. Early on, like the most notable thing to me was when Dax legitimately screwed up his right hand on the ring post. Like to me, that is where the whole dynamic of the match should have changed if you're the Bucks and you should only exclusively be working that hand and looking to cripple it and debilitate it or debilitate even the left hand so that way Dax doesn't have a functional hand. No, no, we got to get shit in. All the ripping off of all the moves from all the legends. I don't like it. It's stupid. Just more perfect example of why I don't like the Bucks of Suck because they're rip-off artists. That's all the hell they are. And this is what this match was. It was typical Young Bucks, Bucks of Suck BS. It's nothing but going in there and spot after spot after spot after spot. There is no storytelling. There is no selling. There is no rhyme. There is no reason. You're doing all this high-impact stuff, and then people kick out of it. And lo and behold, don't you know, when you get to the effing finish, it's some barefooted super kick. And after all the crap that I've seen, that's supposed to end it? Like, every time I want to be a little kinder to the Bucks, and I want to sit there and say, they're not so bad. They have those moments. And then they completely and totally fall off the wagon, and too many of you are in that Meltzer mindset that you put your pocket rocket in the wash position, ready to give this thing seven shots. Not even stars, seven shots, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Vaseline, lotion, who needs it? I'll let the blood from rubbing it raw take care of all that. Like, no, this is not good. Like, I know a lot of y'all are going to sit there because you have no taste anymore. Oh, they did all these spots. So that makes it great wrestling. No, it sucks. Like, god damn, can we have some decent standards in wrestling anymore? Like, their stuff is stupid. And every match that you see with the box where it seems like they're actually trying to work a little bit. And they're actually trying to tell a story a little bit. And they're actually trying to... Play off of each other's characters a little bit. Then you get to this, and it's just totally random, dumb crap with a finish that falls flat. And yet these nerds sit there and geek out for it. What the hell is wrong with wrestling, man? Ah, that's so frustrating. It was my second least favorite match of the night. Second least favorite. But a lot of you, that's going to be one of your matches of the night or even matches of the year. And I, I got to just totally leave it. Uh, but my worst match of the night has to be that Elite Deletion match. Sammy Guevara, Matt Hardy. Uh, you could tell Jerry, or JR, excuse me, Jerry, what the fuck's the difference at this point? JR clearly wasn't a fan of this. I clearly wasn't a fan of this. I'd rather just not have any commentary at all for this and just let it be a total cinematic thing. But, you know, maybe Matt Hardy, you're not as great and creative with the cinematic stuff on a consistent basis as you may be a legend. Think yourself to be. I mean, I appreciate the effort to try to be different. I'm always going to applaud trying to be different. But sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, cameos from the Hurricane and Gangrel aren't going to help this but so much. I've seen a lot of this crap before. What was truly unique or different about it? And beyond all of that, like, this lives up to the final deletion match from a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. You know, this is a fine burial of young talent that the man with three H's could be proud of. But you couldn't at least have Sammy win first? Couldn't you at least let Sammy get the pinfall victory and then smash his head like a freaking coconut with the chair against the concrete? Now, granted, I will give you, that spot looked real. That looked sick. That looked fantastic. But it just... The whole thing to me is a hard pass. And you're, you're, you're sitting there and you're rolling out Sammy afterwards and people are hypothesizing that this might lead to a baby face turn and all of that. It is what it is, um, but not, certainly was my least favorite segment of the night. And I think part of that, too, was the fact that I was looking at this and saying, you know, it's almost 11 o'clock, sitting through this. I guess still get to Evan Jeff and Jericho and then uh, Moxley and Kingston for the title. Like, I could have done without this, personally. MJF versus Chris Jericho uh, it was okay. Like, me personally, I probably would have preferred a finger poke of doom here. Could have saved me 15 or 20 minutes. And done something creative. I might have liked that. And not every match has to be a match. Not every match has to go the full length that you can. 
MJF wins. He's in the inner circle. I appreciate how they did this to a degree. But I might have liked something a little bit different and a little bit shorter to have gotten to the ultimate point. Did anybody really think that MJF was going to lose this, that MJF wasn't going to end up in the inner circle? Wouldn't you have rather have seen maybe at least you're going to do this something where the inner circle turned on Jericho and aligned with MJF? I mean, you know, say what you want about Jericho politically. It is what it is. But the reality is, is probably the best thing about this match is his interest with everybody singing along. Like, that's kind of the highlight, and it's all downhill from there. <laughs> it's just, I would have liked to maybe had this a little bit earlier than I Maybe my attitude and mindset would have been a little bit better. Uh, and then when we got to the main event, the I Quit match for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship, Eddie Kingston versus John Moxley. Like, look, I'm a Kingston fan, and I'm glad to see him getting the spotlight and the opportunity here. And I, I'm sensitive to the fact that you're trying to pay homage to one of your mentors, one of your idols, Tracy Smothers, and all of that. But I'm sitting there trying to I'm sitting there trying to take you seriously. And that's what you wear. Looking like some reject Power Ranger. Like that looked horrible. Now even with that said, it was Matthew Bachamania dude. Whatever the fuck his name is. I thought he put it so perfectly on Twitter Saturday night. He's like, the being the elite guys can try to make you care, and I just don't care, and I'm totally with him. But Eddie Kingston has that ability to make you care, and I am 100% down with him. Like I think that's a perfect way to express my kind of thoughts here. Um, this match was brutal. It was violent. It, was, it took a little bit to get going, but once it went, got going, man, this thing was brutal. It was everything it should have been out of a... Main event with two guys in an I quit match where you have years of history and everything else. This is exactly what it should have been. Um, he had folks wondering whether Pac was going to come out and interfere and cost Kingston or maybe cost Moxley either way. Um, I, I wish Kingston could have found a way to win this match. It would have been nice to see Kingston even get a short run with the belt. And maybe you could do that in the future, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't want to trust him with the top belt in your company. But I also think there's a bit of a problem here is now you're getting to a point if you're AEW, you've built up Moxley to such a point, and you're having him beat everybody, it feels like. Like, well, you're going to have Kenny Omega beat him now? If you do, like, a lot of people legitimately should fart at that. Because there's no way that feels right. Because what the hell has Omega done? Oh, now he's got the dancing girls! And they're cleaning and sweeping up! <laughs> That sucks. Like, it kind of feels like a little bit of a problem here. Like, who are you going to have beat Moxley? Because he's beat pretty much everybody now. It's probably time to get that strap off of him, I'm just saying. Um, but I really did enjoy this main event. Uh, it was one of the matches I was looking forward to most on this show, and I feel like it mostly delivered, outside of maybe the disappointment of wanting to see Eddie Kingston get his real moment in the sun, I had to realistically understand that it's an I quit match. It's, it's, that's not going to happen. More likely not, not going to happen here. So, um, but in general, like I said, it was a good show. Certainly much, much better than All Out. I thought the pacing of this was better. You had some clunkers in there, and you're going to have that sometimes. But the good was very good. Um, you know, some guys looked really, really good on the night in terms of their performances. You know, I know a lot of you are going to think even higher on this show because you're going to be even bigger on Omega and Page than I am, and that's okay. That comes down to more like taste and stylistic preferences in wrestling. Certainly know a lot of you are going to be much bigger on the Young Bucks and FDR thing. Like you're going to look and say, hey, the guy, and, I, and maybe I'll give that to you. Maybe I could say the best storytelling element of the entire match, of course, came at the very freaking end, is that when the dude gets up from FTR on the top rope, was a cash wheeler? Um, he gets up and he does the 450 and it misses. These are the guys, no flips, just fists. And then he does a flip and then they lose. Like, maybe I'll give that to you. But the rest of it was just spot monkey garbage. It really was. So it's just not my flavor. Uh, and hopefully we can stop doing these um, cinematic matches for Matt Hardy for a little while. Put those on hold just a little bit. So it feels like... Uh, last night's was about one too many. But you can let me know what you thought of this show if you enjoyed this review or if you didn't. You want to sit there and look at my ugly mug and rant at me every time I do a video. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. Click the bell so that way you're notified of future videos. And also make sure you check out my 30 Days of Undertaker video series. 30 videos in 30 days highlighting the career and legacy of the dead man. 
If you're wondering if you should check out this show, eh, you can find it somewhere you don't have to pay 50 bucks for it, I would say yes, go ahead.